This guide aims to provide some early comprehensive assistance to your SnowRunner journey and I'll start by outlining what I will cover in this video. The video is chaptered so please feel free to navigate through to whatever section you want to view. First, we'll start off with the gameplay loop, so what exactly you are doing in SnowRunner and how the progression works. Next, I'll go through using the map, discovering watchtowers and how to use the map to your advantage. Following this, a quick blast through the tutorial mission which has you building a bridge so you can access your first garage and get started in the game. Then I'll run through some basic driving tips for SnowRunner and is more of an arcade simulator compared to its predecessors. Section 5 will cover the GMC 9500 versus the Fleetstar 2070A. And then after that we'll talk about vehicle add-ons, weight distribution, all-wheel drive, diff lock, truck gears and gearboxes. And ultimately covering the game's economy, buying and selling trucks, trailers and add-ons etc. And then finally my advice for playing a region. So into the first topic, the gameplay loop. What is SnowRunner about? If you have no idea, SnowRunner is a trucking game where you deliver a variety of cargos across difficult terrain to aid the local industry and to help clear up disaster areas such as roadblocks. By carrying out tasks and contracts, you will earn yourself money and experience which will allow you to rank up. The money and additional ranks will unlock more vehicle add-ons, tires and other vehicles for you to buy and use however you please. The highest rank is 30 and that is achievable before going to the third base game map of Tamir. The next part of the gameplay loop is the exploration of each map within a region. To clarify, a region is made up of 2-4 maps that are connected by gateways. The tasks are local to each map, i.e. each map will have its own set of tasks, and then the contracts are spread across the region and often involve taking cargo from one map to another to complete the contract. Once certain contracts have been completed, you will fulfill the regional objectives which are shown on the region screen, though this doesn't actually do anything. Finding all the upgrades, vehicles, tasks, contracts and contests will enable you to 100% a region. As a reference, it took me around 54 hours to 100% Michigan using just the Ford CLT 9000, though I'm sure it can be done more quickly than this as this is part of a challenge run. Our next topic is using the map. The map will help guide you around the SnowRunner world, highlighting vehicles, tasks, trailers and cargo locations. Familiarise yourself with scrolling down to see which buildings are on the map as these will let you know what cargo items are available for the tasks and contracts you'll be carrying out. All maps start with a degree of shadowing, but using watchtowers will clear huge areas and will identify multiple points of interest for you to visit. Here you can see how much of the map is revealed just by driving, and here you can see how much of the map is cleared by using a watchtower, so always be sure to make the best use of them and not ignore them. Later on in the Season 1 DLC, there is a radar trailer which can scan an area wherever you are at the cost of fuel, although I don't find that I use it very often. In each map, there will be trailers scattered around that have cargo related to tasks which normally include building bridges or clearing Roblox, so make sure to utilise these once the cargo is used. You'll also get a free trailer too, which is especially handy for hard mod players because it saves you the money in the long run. With the map open, you can place waypoints wherever you want to and build up long transit routes for when you're still familiarising yourself with the map, though eventually you'll get to the point where you know where you're going. The map can also be used to skip time by 6 hours. This is handy if you hate driving at night, but do be aware that time cannot be skipped in hard mod. Okay, into the tutorial mission. At the very start of the game, there is a brief tutorial that takes you through exploring the way to a watchtower getting your first truck and delivering cargo to a bridge before you're left to free roam your way to the garage in Black River. Time can be saved during this mission with a few easy steps and this is where it helps to pay attention to your surroundings and use the map. As you can see we're loading up with metal beams and if we check the mission briefing it's a two stage mission first requiring metal beams and then two wooden planks. Just by the sawmill here, across from where you get the GMC, there is a small red trailer tucked away, so drive near it, but not too close, as there is a patch of mud to catch you out. You can hold the trailer out by attaching your winch to the trailer's hitch and pulling on it. You can then attach properly and take both sets of cargo to the bridge, so what you've done there is reduced your overall driving time, making yourself more efficient. Be sure to try and plan and combine your cargo list for multiple missions so you can deliver items all in one trip rather than taking multiple journeys. Now you've completed the bridge, leave the trailer behind because it's only dead weight now that will get you stuck. You can always come back for it later, as vehicles and trailers will remain on the map forever if you leave them. Finish the tutorial by heading to the garage, 
switch into Alaska and then back to Michigan as you're then ready to free roam to do whatever you want. Or if you're feeling brave, go straight to Tamir. So we've made it to the garage. Let's jump out with the truck as it is. We've got the sideboard bed and the highway tires, which are rubbish. You'll have noticed a truck out front, so grab that by going near it, including grabbing the upgrade in front of it, which is the all-wheel drive upgrade for the Fleet Star 2070A. Hop into the Fleet Star and hit recover. This will fix and refuel the truck ready for use, then add the all-wheel drive add-on to the truck and a low saddle and deploy the truck outside. Now we're going to go through a few driving tips for getting started. For starters, avoid mud like the plague. Your highway tires are completely unsuitable for this type of ground and you'll just become frustrated with trying to go through it. Instead, go around it. Most of the time the grass will support your truck and you'll have more traction on grass than you do with mud. If you are in the mud and stuck, you can use your winch from multiple spots on the truck providing there is something to winch from. Go for big trees or posts as small trees will just be torn down. When in dirt or mud conditions, take care as to what you can see coming from the wheels. If you're seeing mud or water being sprayed from the wheels, this means you're just digging in and wasted energy and you won't move very quickly. Slow down your driving wheels rotation by either using low gear or by being very gentle with the accelerator in the auto gear as this will give the wheels optimum traction potential which we'll touch again on soon. For smooth pathways be sure to use the high gear which will maintain your speed without changing gears all the time as the auto gearing is very delicate. Using all wheel drive will consume more fuel when it is engaged. Having a bit of weight on the rear wheels will help with traction, especially handy for exploration in areas that have unlimited cargo. As you rank up you will unlock better tyres, so be sure to upgrade them when you can and then sell your old tyres as you won't need them anymore. All terrain tyres unlock from rank 6, off-road tyres unlock from rank 8, mud tyres unlock from rank 13 and chain tyres unlock from rank 12. These level unlocks can vary depending on the specific tyre type, but these are generally what you should be going for, but by rank 15 you should have access to all the tyres. My go-to tyre for most trucks is the UOD2. For whatever reason, the number 2 set of tyres seems to be the best performing when it comes to like dirt and mud. Mud tyres are good for mud, but will have worse performance in off-road conditions compared to off-road tyres, so be sure to go with whatever is more appropriate at the time. For additional information you can seek out the tyre chart on mattrunner.info and go for the tyres that have the highest numbers associated. Lastly on tyres, chain tyres work only on ice and icy roads and do not use them for traversing through snow. In this game snow behaves in the same way as mud. Tyres will also affect your truck's stability so where you can use the widest tyre sets as this will reduce your likelihood of rolling over. The highway trucks might seem like a pointless joke, but in SnowRunner a truck's performance mostly comes down to the tyres chosen. With UOD2 tyres equipped, any truck can become capable within reason as I have demonstrated in Michigan and Alaska where I have 100% completion using just those trucks, neither of which have all-wheel drive or diff lock. Earlier I mentioned controlling the accelerator for getting out of sticky situations. Here you can see the Transtar 4070A is stuck in the mud here. I'm going to gently accelerate and you can see each set of wheels spinning at different rates. This one isn't spinning so if I apply a little more power I should be able to creep out. Finesse is your friend for getting out of mud. Wiggle steering is an age old trick. By constantly moving from full lock left to full lock right you will move the mud or dirt out of the way creating a path of least resistance. It might seem weird to do but it will help. If you're struggling to set off from a standing position or on a hill for example and the truck isn't moving, try different gears but also try adjusting the steering because again you're more likely to move by driving the truck along the path of least resistance which is normally just straight forwards. If your steering wheels are facing to the left or the right you're actually trying to push the truck in two directions at once and not just one which makes movement harder. Vehicles in SnowRunner will take damage when crashing into trees, barriers, other trucks and lots of other ways such as driving quickly on a paved road over branches and boulders. There are five damage categories with each having their own influence on how the truck performs. The first is tyres. Each tyre has its own health which is typically 50 points though there are some trucks that have 100 points per wheel. When the wheel reaches zero the tyre will no longer prop up the truck in the same way and it will increase the difficulty in handling and grip. Next is the fuel tank. 
This is entirely fine until the points hit zero, but when it does, you'll slowly lose fuel over time until the tank is repaired or empty. Next we have the engine. Once it hits a critical point, the engine will consume more fuel and will occasionally lose revs, causing the truck to stall if you don't stop accelerating. When the engine points hit zero, the engine will be unable to start. Next is the gearbox. This can be damaged in two ways. First is if you drive on hard surfaces with diff lock engaged. You'll see the drive aspects of the truck glow red and then you take 25 points of damage. The second way to take damage is once the engine has suffered enough damage and then the truck collides with something, you will also start to take gearbox damage. Once the gearbox has taken enough damage, the truck will drop out of gear at random into neutral. If fully damaged, the truck will no longer drive regardless of the gear selected. Lastly is the suspension. When the suspension is completely broken, you'll lose your ground clearance, making handling harder and getting through mud even harder. Now I'm going to briefly talk through the first two trucks you have by default. The GMC 9500 is a highway class truck, but don't let that put you off. When properly outfitted, it can be a formidable machine. Unfortunately, you won't have it at full strength until you visit Kola Peninsula, as that's where the all-wheel drive upgrade is located, behind a paywall. It has good sized wheels and good ground clearance and can equip the basic majority of add-ons you'll need to get through Michigan. It has good power and stability as long as you don't drive it like a lunatic. The Fleet Star does have both all-wheel drive and diff lock which are both on a toggle but it does ride a little lower but it will get you through a multitude of situations. Of the two trucks, it is the one I would sometimes equip a loading crane to as the cranes add weight to the front axle. So if you don't have all-wheel drive, you'll struggle with hills and getting out of mud without those front driving wheels. Each vehicle has stats that indicate its performance. The three main stats displayed are power to weight ratio, durability and fuel consumption. Each stat has a range from C- to S+, where S plus is best. I'll describe durability first. As far as I'm aware, the, this is just the tally of the vehicle's component parts. It only adjusts with a few tweaks sometimes, which mainly come from either the gearbox and or the engine. Power to weight ratio is the ratio calculated by dividing the engine torque expressed in newton centimeters by the weight of the vehicle in kilograms. So for example, the CAT 745C has a default weight of 25,000 kilograms and the Westline M2450 has a torque rating of 250,000 newton centimeters. Divide the torque by the weight to get a 10 to 1 ratio, so that's 10 newton centimeters of torque for every kilogram of weight. This is then expressed with a letter grading with S plus being the best ratio. The idea being that the engine far exceeds the truck's requirement to move itself, so that it can be loaded up for transporting many items of cargo, so it's always important to scout out those engine upgrades. The way the trucks are given to you in SnowRunner often means that they will in fact need the engine upgrade on purpose or else they will feel underpowered. I never shy away from the most powerful engine even if it appears to destroy the fuel economy of the truck. Fuel consumption is the last of the key stats and something to be aware of especially for hard mode. Each truck has its own fuel consumption rate, while some may be similar to others such as the Azov 64131 and the Azov 73210, others vary wildly such as the Ankh Mark 38. Increased fuel consumption comes from more powerful engines, the use of all-wheel drive, driving through difficult terrain and hauling cargo potentially exceeding the truck's recommended capacity which all stress the engine. The Azov 6 default engine has a B plus rating for fuel consumption at maximum revs in neutral at 8 litres per minute, whereas the most powerful engine for the same truck in neutral revs at 10.5 litres per minute, which is an increase of just over 25%, which might seem a lot, but actually it isn't. On the other hand, trucks like the Ankh Mark 38 will have an erratic consumption rate, showing anything between less than 10 litres per minute to over 20 litres per minute at times, given the high speeds and changes in terrain under each wheel. Lastly on fuel, a vehicle may say that the fuel consumption is C-, minus. But here, as you can see for the CAT 745C, it's not an issue at all. Get a feel for each truck's ability by actually driving them and not purely relying on these three stats. Apart from the scouts, the trucks in the game can have many different add-ons equipped from fuel tankers to flatbeds and extra repair parts. Each add-on adds weight to the truck by different amounts and in different ways. For instance, I just mentioned that the small loading cranes add weight over the front wheels, making them more prone to digging into the ground, whereas large cranes add their weight to the rear wheels, and you can see this impact when you scroll through the add-ons list in the garage. 
Your first instinct may be to add a small crane, but that weighs 3 tons which is a lot heavier than the cargo you're starting out with, especially on the smaller trucks that might be lacking in power. Try to only use a crane when necessary, such as a rescue mission or a mission that requires you to collect stranded cargo. Typically, cargo on your truck will actually help your performance in off-road conditions as the weight will push down through the mud so that the wheels make contact with the material beneath giving you traction. This is where it pays to know where to use a flatbed, use a trailer hitch, or a saddle trailer. A flatbed or sideboard bed is your go-to for cargo up to two slots in size which will get you through most of Michigan with a lot of back and forth driving. For some of the later missions, there is larger cargo requirements, so you'll probably want a trailer. A hitch trailer is a trailer that attaches straight to the back of your truck, allowing you to haul an additional 1-4 to four cargo depending on the trailer. However, because the majority of the truck and trailer weight is, is in just the trailer, your power output will diminish a lot, and the trailer wheels are great at not being very helpful. So basically, your ability to get through tough terrain will decrease a lot unless you have a more powerful truck with all-wheel drive. Ideal trucks for towing hitch trailers through muddy terrain are 8x8 trucks. 6x6 trucks can do this, but not as well. A saddle trailer attaches to either your low or high saddle so that the cargo's weight is actually being applied to the rear wheels driving the truck. The typical saddle trailer I use a lot is the sideboard semi trailer allowing 5 slots of cargo to be hauled with little fuss. You can get creative with your cargo stacking to transport more without packing it down as well, but that's more of an advanced technique. Saddle trailers are great for rear-wheel drive trucks such as the GMC 9500, Ford CLT 9000 and Transtar 47A and a couple of others. Their high power to weight ratio allows them to haul saddle trailers without too many issues. Just don't use the gooseneck low loader trailer because that's just painful. When delivering cargo it will need to be packed properly or else you cannot unload it. However some cargo changes mass between its packed and unpacked state. This can be used to your advantage if you're stuck. If your wheels are unable to rotate due to compression, try unpacking the cargo and changing gears to see if that helps. The cargo won't just slide off the truck, especially if you have a sideboard bed, but it can be useful in a pinch. Next on the list is all-wheel drive and diff lock. What they do and do you need them all the time? All-wheel drive is a system that engages all the wheels to drive, hence the name. Typically, trucks are rear-wheel drive in either a 4x2, 6x4 or 8x4 configuration, so all-wheel drive will provide driving to all of the front wheels at the cost of extra fuel. All-wheel drive is really handy for hill climbing and for getting out of mud, as a lot of muddy areas tend to be shallow pits, so where the rear-wheel drive will push its way through the mud, it may struggle to get out at the far end because it's pushing the front of the truck where the engine is, which is a lot heavier. All-wheel drive can be used on any surface where there is a penalty to fuel usage and this usage is variable and depends on the gearbox being used and the truck itself. Some heavy trucks can use the advanced special gearbox which does not consume extra fuel but on the other hand the Western Star 6900 can consume over 30 litres per minute so it may seem like you have a leaky fuel tank. Some trucks do have all-wheel drive always on. You do not need all-wheel drive all the time, but it does help in difficult conditions, especially when towing a trailer or another truck for that extra pulling power. Diff lock or differential locking is a system that restricts drive wheel rotation speed to that of the slowest rotating wheel. This helps you engage with the most traction without spinning the wheels wildly. Diff lock can only be engaged when using the low or reverse gears except for trucks that have diff lock always on which can use diff lock in any gear without penalty. If you drive for prolonged periods on hard surfaces with diff lock engaged you will cause damage to the gearbox as the harder ground conditions provide more wear and heat buildup to the components. There are a few exceptions though when driving on hard surfaces where you can use diff lock and one of those is hill climbing on roads. As we have briefly touched on already in SnowRunner, trucks have different gears that you can utilise for different situations. Starting with the automatic gears, depending on your gearbox, you will have somewhere between 3 and 8 automatic gears, each one faster than the previous, just like in a car or a truck. However, SnowRunner automatic gearboxes are temperamental and only with a slight resistance will it revert back to first gear, so we won't use automatic gears too often. If you're travelling long distances on a consistent surface that isn't mud, I'd highly recommend the high gear. Lastly, for automatic gears, if stationary and you press the brake, the truck will start to reverse like an automatic gearbox in other driving games. 
The high gear has a set minimum rotation speed for the wheels and the truck will do its best to maintain this speed or else the truck will stall. You can only use this gear once you're already moving and the engine input is high enough. So basically you cannot use the high gear from a standard start. It would be like trying to move off in a car in sixth gear. You can get away with high gear starts if you're facing downhill however. High gear will travel at speeds between about 60 to 80% of the truck's overall top speed for that gearbox and is a great choice for covering distances especially on dirt or paved roads or even lightly muddy roads. For snow and full mud and water this isn't an optimal choice as you will just dig in. The low gear can have between one and three options depending on your gearbox. The off-road gearbox grants three low gears. The low gears limit the upper rotational speed of your wheels and is best utilized in mud or snow conditions where low speed rotation helps maintain the best traction performance. Low minus is the absolute slowest and low plus is a decent speed through rough terrain. The optimal gear to select is the one that throws up the least amount of material when you're trying to drive. Also, as a side note, the low gear has little to do with torque output. If you're struggling to set off from a position, change gear. As mentioned previously, low gear is required to engage a truck's diff lock if the diff lock is not set to always on. An underused aspect of the low gear is downhill descent, especially on icy roads. Above a certain speed, traction goes out of the window in SnowRunner and if I had a penny for the number of reddit posts I've seen from the bottom of a hill with cargo spewed everywhere and truck on its roof, I'd be a rich man. Low gear stops the truck from just jackknifing and rolling when speeding down hills. Yes, it might be boring and take a lot longer, but you won't need to spend the next hour repacking all of your cargo. Neutral is neutral. If you engage the accelerator, the truck will just make a big noise and not move. Reverse gear is your gear for going backwards, or reverse. When engaged, the controls are the same as if you were in the forward gears, but you'll travel backwards instead. So, quickly onto gearboxes. There are so many options for gearboxes, but I'm just going to talk about a general few key ones that'll come up again and again. So, your balanced or stock gearbox will tend to come with five auto gears and one low gear. High range gearbox tend to come with about six auto gears and a low gear, and this is a fast gearbox. Off road gearboxes tend to come with four to five automatic gears and three low gears and this is a relatively slow gearbox. The special gearbox comes as a stock for some heavy trucks and has four auto gears, a low and a high gear. The advanced special gearbox is my favourite and it upgrades the special gearbox. This one has five auto gears, a high gear and three low gears. The fine tune gearbox is a DLC gearbox from the Season 3 Wisconsin that has four auto gears, a high gear, tunable lot and reverse gear so you can have the exact wheel speed you want though this comes at the cost of more extra fuel. There are many other gearboxes but I won't cover them now. Our penultimate subject is going to cover the game's economy so buying and selling trucks and trailers, add-ons and where you can make extra money. So when you complete a task or a contract you are awarded money and experience. In the base game regions so Michigan, Alaska and Tamir the rewards overall are fairly low compared to what you receive in the DLC regions. However, if you aim to complete the majority of missions, you'll be near rank 30 by the time you get to Tamir, and you can buy whatever truck you want. Plus, you'll earn money and experience from co-op games, so you can just boost up that way too if you really want to. Contests are time attack challenges with rule sets, which can be run multiple times for bonus cash and experience. However, as you play through, you will come across many trucks in the game world that you can do whatever you want with. If you don't like something, then you can just sell it. Trucks, trailers and add-ons all buy and sell for 100% of their value, so you never lose any money on buying a truck that you don't like, unless you keep the internal add-ons you've installed like the tires. A lot of people like to clean up all of the trailers that are spread across the map to make even more money on top of that. Additionally, there are free LC trucks available that are valuable both for making money and also for using. So these days, money is no issue in the game, unless you're playing hard mode. Hard mode makes you pay for fuel and repairs, and you cannot sell trailers at all. Any fuel trailer you buy in hard mode will also be empty, unlike in normal mode where it comes fully fueled. Hard mode teaches you how to drive cautiously as every bit of damage you take or every wrong direction you take will cost you money later on. It's not for the faint of heart. Recovery becomes more expensive too, with the cost depending on the vehicle's size. 
Even moving trucks between regions and garages will also cost you money. Be sure to scout ahead for the fuel stations as not all fuel stations will be as cheap as $2 per litre. Some can be as high as $8 per litre. So be sure to select your most economical trucks. The Azov 6 and 7 say hello. You can't skip time either. And as I forgot to mention earlier, trucks will sell at only 50% of their value. We've reached the final chapter. My recommendations for playing a region step by step. Of course, I'm not saying that you should do this, I'm just going to outline what I do. So we've loaded into Michigan and the majority of the map is dark apart from where we've been before. I'm going to take my Chevy CK1500 out for a spin and start by hitting the watchtowers to reveal as much of the map as possible where I can. I'll also accept every task I see. Some may be off the beaten track a little bit to start with, but that's okay. As we mentioned in the beginning, the tasks are relative to that particular map, whereas the contracts span multiple maps, so I would focus on the tasks first, as these will include clearing roadblocks and building bridges. Basically, these will open up your transit routes, so you can make your journeys in the future as simple as possible without having to duck and dive off-road all the time. Where it's muddy, perhaps leave those tasks until you have better tyres or a longer winch cable. There's no rush. Starting with the tasks will also familiarise you with where the cargo stores are and what you'll need for your contracts. With the map revealed and the tasks accepted and the roadways made, go through the tasks one by one to see if there are any that overlap with certain cargo requirements. For example, there may be two tasks that both require two wooden planks but to be delivered to two different places. You could make two separate journeys, but this would actually be four because you would have to drive there and back twice. Instead, take a low saddle trailer, take the four wooden planks and then deliver them straight to destination A and then straight on to B, which will save you time and money. Wrap up the tasks and contests and you'll be left with the contracts. Again, start with local ones, eventually radiating further afield. Sometimes the bridges and roadblocks will actually be part of contracts, so make sure to double check them as soon as you get into a map for the first time. With your first map mostly clear, you can now move on to Smithville Dam, where you'll start the process again with some basic exploration. I will warn you though that not every map has a garage, but nearly every map will have at least a trailer store to assist. Island Lake doesn't have a garage, and people used to think you needed a fleet of vehicles to get stuff done. And I've proved this wrong when I used nothing but one Ford CLT 9000 with a low saddle and a sideboard semi-trailer and I had the majority of the map done within three hours as there is plenty of fuel trailers around and a trailer store so there's nothing to worry about. If you want to plan ahead you can use maprunner.info which will detail where all vehicles, trailers, garages and upgrades are so you'll never have to enter a map feeling anxious. Lastly, if you're looking to branch out your vehicle fleet at the beginning of the game, I have some suggestions to help you mix things up starting with the North American category of trucks. So we have the International Lodestar 1700 and the International Paystar 5070. The Lodestar is a wonderful scout and the Paystar is an excellent cargo hauler and it does actually get the ability to have mud tires at the beginning. And then onto Eurasia, we've got the Azov 64131 one of my all-time favorite trucks for SnowRunner. It's versatile, capable, and very powerful. Then we also have the Voron AE and the Voron D of the Voron Triple Family. Uh, these are just very good. There's some unique aspects to them. They're both solid at cargo hauling, whether or not it be with a flatbed or with a saddle trailer. And after 5,300 words, we've reached the end. I certainly hope you have enjoyed this guide and found it to be useful. If you have, then by all means, please let me know down below as it helps direct me for making more helpful guides. If you want to support me further, then consider subscribing to the channel. And if you want to go whole hog, then consider becoming a channel member. If you want to see these kinds of guides in action, then check out my season 10 and season 11 Let's Play as well as my no all-wheel drive and diff lock series. Thank you very much and goodbye.